I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to bring Cindy Lusk today onto the podcast. She is the author of Align and Refine, The Journey of Yoga and Meditation. Cindy, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, can you how, can you just fill me in a little bit on how your day is going so far? How are you feeling? Hi, Todd. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> I'm having a good day. Uh, we've been in a deep freeze here for the last three, four days, and I've hardly stepped out of the house wow. except to go shovel snow. Where are you? So, um, it's actually making me really grateful that I've got a nice warm house and all of that going on. Oh, yeah. So, where Where are you? I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Wonderful. Yeah. Lucky you. I hear it's amazing there. I've never had a chance to go to Boulder, but I just feel like it's the epicenter of yoga, meditation, and yeah, there's been so much in. going on here over the years from Naropa and you know all the different yoga and massage schools and uh, you know the uh, yeah, just lots of things like that. That's cool. Mm. What was your? Where were you born? I'm actually from Morgantown, West Virginia. Cool. Um, and my dad was in the military. And so we um, moved around a, a whole lot. Yeah. And, hear uh, you. Yeah. I believe Including that. living in Europe for a while. Wow. So, At, yeah. Where did you graduate from high school? In California. Whoa. What part? And that set me up to, uh, I went to, as an undergraduate, I went to the University of California, Santa Cruz. And that's actually where I took my first yoga class. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Santa Cruz, I, I have been to Santa Cruz. That is another epicenter. Uh, I know. Great. I thing. know. I feel so lucky. I went to undergraduate in Santa Cruz and then graduate school in Boulder. <laughs> what was your major and graduate work with? So, psychology, social psychology. Cool. I was really fortunate to study with a man named um, Elliot Aronson, who's one of the top social psychologists at the time anyway. And uh, I had, through the experiences of moving around, you know, been in pretty integrated schools when I was in military schools, like in Europe. And then I got to San Antonio, Texas, and there was uh, a lot, you know, and this was in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And and actually, we went to Syracuse, New York first, and I was involved in a busing project there. And then um, when I got into junior high and high school and in Texas, there was just a lot of racial tension and, and so on. And I was very intrigued by all of that. And that is actually what sent me into... Um, studying social psychology because wow. I wanted to address prejudice and racism. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Being yeah. around during that time and mm -hmm. aware of what's going on. That's incredible. I can yeah. see, how, I could see how that would push you or nudge you in the direction of how do I start to understand social psychology, the psychology of our society? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because I wrote a dissertation on how to change stereotypes and basically found they're very impermeable to change. At the same time, I had started really, really getting into yoga with uh, Richard Freeman. Wow. And um, I, I, although I got a job for a while, um, you know, related to my PhD, I finally decided that if I really wanted to address some of these social issues, I had to look at people's hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. That no amount of like evidence on the surface of life changes people that much. So I really wanted to find a modality that penetrated into people's hearts. So that's why I just kind of gave all that up and moved into teaching yoga. Very cool. Yeah. How have you been able to weave your social psychology background into your yoga teaching? Like, what's an example of a way that your curiosity about understanding why humans do what they do in a social mm -hmm. setting, how, how did that shape your yoga teaching? 
Well, as I said, I kind of got the sense that we really had to work with people's hearts. And what I found with myself is that the yoga was changing me from the inside out rather than trying to, to um, you know, do things from the outside in. All that's important. You know, it's important to have laws and regulations and all of that stuff. But um, especially as I started studying yoga philosophy, I, I, I did see some overlap between what the sages, the ancient sages in the texts were teaching and what I had learned in psychology in general. And, um, you know, for example, when I got to um, studying some of the tantras, one of which is the Shiva Sutra, um, the very first couple aphorisms allude to these mechaniz mechanisms that the tantras talk about called the malas, which are these obscurations of the heart. The fundamental one is called the anavamala, which is basically a squeeze from, you know, from a tantric perspective, everything is divine consciousness, but we as individuals get squeezed into this human existence. And so we go from this very omnipresent, um, elevated consciousness into these human bodies. And it leaves us feeling kind of less than, it leaves us feeling constricted. And um, from that place of constriction also arises a sense of differentiation, which is um, another one of the malas where we see ourselves separate from each other. So that separateness, when I started reading about uh, the Maya Mala, it's called, when I started learning about that, I was like, wow, this is just kind of what I, you know, is an explanation for that sense of in-group and out-group, which was a big topic in um, social psychology of us and them, and how that can then lead to all of these differentiating and negative behaviors toward one another. Wow. Beautifully said. That was a good explanation. Yeah. That's cool. The us and then them as what being one of the underpinnings of why we can't get along. Yeah, of course. And um, I mean, you see it. It's all the so-called tribalism or whatever. That's not yeah. the best way to put it, but you yeah. know, the gr different groups and there's a lot of famous so social psychology experiments around, you know, in group and out group and so forth. But um, yeah, that's cool. And so you wait, you were in Santa Cruz, you took your first yoga class. And then after realizing, wait, I want to work with people on a level where we change. From well, the yeah, I mean, actually, I want to give a shout out my first uh, yoga teacher Please. was named Ann Barrows. She's a very sweet Iyengar teacher who recently passed away. And, um, you know, I was in college, I was taking all kinds of things. Yeah. And yoga was one of them being Santa Cruz, you could take yoga for credit there way back in the late <laughs> 70s. And um, then I came out here to go to grad school. And what happened was, I was in a romantic relationship that uh, just ended abruptly. And I was heartbroken. And I, for some reason, I was called to start um, looking for a yoga teacher at that time, which, you know, one of the things I take from that as a teacher, a yoga teacher, really any kind of teacher is that you never know, like Ann Burroughs planted a seed in me that when the conditions were right, kind of sprouted me to go back to that. Like she probably saw me one semester and then wondered, or never saw me again and thought, oh, well, that's a lost cause. But often we never know when we plant these seeds, how, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to impact people's lives. And I found point. that out. So that's, that led me to search out a teacher who sent me to Richard Freeman, who nice. um, is an amazing teacher, as many people know. He's an amazing teacher. You're right. Yeah. So yeah. you, you were went from the Iyengar school to the Ashtanga school. How was that transition? Yeah. For you? Well, you know, honestly, uh, Richard was teaching more an Iyengar method at the time. That's right. And he um, 
it was funny back then, you know, there wasn't the internet <laughs> or email lists or any of that, you know, uh, it was word of mouth a lot. And a couple of people have said, you really need to, you know, if, you're, if you want to do yoga, you got to go find Richard. And so the way you found him was through some poster at the health food store or oh, <laughs> something awesome. like that. And um, those are the good old days for sure. Yeah. And he yes. was teaching in all these different funky places. And um, and then he would disappear for a while and you'd look for another poster and he'd reappear. And I remember there was a distinct time when he was having a weekend workshop and, you know, all of us showed up and all of a sudden we were like doing these jumpings. And <laughs> I was like, what is this? I remember one of my friends you know, turned to me like, what the heck is this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he really brought us along in the primary series, actually, uh, quite quickly, <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> because he was really into it. And I think he, I think he had gone to a workshop with the Tabby Joyce at um, Feathered Pipe. Mm. And Feather and Pipe is where? Where's Feather Pipe? It's is in that? Montana. Montana. Kind does of a famous exist? retreat center still, from way back when. Is that still there? Is Feather Pipe? I still think there? it I is. Heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, so he, uh, that's where you. Yeah, first... and so he came back from that, and and then you know, and then he started bringing us through, and then he would go off to India for months at a time to study with Patabi Joyce, and. Um, Eventually, he established a studio, and honestly, I think in part the reason he established it was because he wanted to host Patabi Joyce. In 1989, Patabi Joyce came to Boulder, and a couple other places, and um, I think he and he went to Encinitas, and um, here in Boulder, he did primary series. And then he was doing intermediate series in um, Encinitas. And I went out there to, to do the, the intermediate series with him. And that's, I think that's when I met Tim Miller. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, he might have come to Boulder to yeah. chauffeur, you know, Bobby Joyce to Encinitas, yeah. but I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't really remember. Yeah. But yeah, okay. I got to meet Tim then. It was it was so it was funny thing. A couple of funny things about that whole situation in Encinitas me. was, and I think it was Solana Beach was the where the where the studio was, um, and it was before Tim had his studio. But um, the first day we all showed up to do intermediate series, and Tim walks in and says, "Well." <laughs> Toby Joyce isn't coming today because he he's going to get a haircut. <laughs> and so Tim led us through primary series. And it was funny because half the people couldn't do it. And he just, at the end of class, he says, I don't know why you people are signed up for intermediate series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, that sounds about right. Yeah. And then during the workshop that week, what, another funny thing that happened was that... Um, for some reason, I was still doing headstand at the wall. And I don't know if I just got away with it in Boulder because he'd been in Boulder the previous week. But by the time I got to Encinitas, he was like, no, you're doing it in the center of the room. And so when we got to headstand, he would come and put, you know, help me balance. Mm -hmm. And then when he got me balanced and everyone else was up in it, he would start his counting and he'd go one, <laughs> two. And for several days, he would get to about 20. And I would think, oh my God, I made it. Because he'd walk away and I would be balancing and I'd be sitting, oh my God, I made it. And then I'd fall over. <laughs> and he would go, oh, bad lady. And he'd come over and get me back up in it. And then he'd start one, <laughs> two. <laughs> And I was just mortified because I thought, oh my God, all these oh, other yeah. people here. <laughs> all this I'm going to throw eggs at my car. That's it forever. Oh my God. But by the end of the week, I was doing headstand in the middle of the room. Oh, by that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Funny. I love and the other thing about that time is we got to, um, he was teaching advanced series. Mm. With Tabby Joyce. And so many of us got to um, observe. We got to see Tim and uh, I think Chuck Miller was there. 
and uh, it's oh, man. just a fun time. It's super and fun. And during that tour, Patabi Joyce, every, you know, told everybody, "Oh, you come from India, you know, you come India." So in 1990, all of us trotted off, and that was my first trip to Mysore. Wow, how was that? What did you think? You know what? It was really challenging for me um, on a lot of levels. I, um, I mean, India blew my mind. Yes. And in 1990, India was a lot different. Traveling in India was a lot different than it is now. Um, and uh, I pretty quickly got sick. Ooh. And, yeah. So you know. Um, like uh, like like I like dysentery. I might, I might die. Type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the yogic weight loss, the oh, India weight loss plan. India weight loss plan. Oh, yeah. Um, so were you able to practice or were you just laid up for well, a long I, I was out a couple days and I was able to practice, but um, uh, what was unfortunate was it was not, not too long after we first got there. And I traveled there with a couple of my girlfriends, um, Teresa and Annie Pace, Annie you Pace. might know. Yeah, we've, yeah. Hosted, we've hosted Annie here at our studio before. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh man, she, she, um, she and I and this other gal uh, traveled there together because we knew oh, each God. other from here, and mm. um, and Patabi Joyce was hosting students at his house, and I was just too sick to go, so I was so disappointed about that. And at that time, I, I think there was only twelve or fifteen of us there. You know, it was very oh, early. Man. It was way before. It was before it exploded. Yeah. Because I went back in 94 and there was about 50 people there. And I went back in 96 and there was about 70 or 80 people there. Yeah. So yes. it got to be quite a, a machination. But I, I got sick. I also ripped a hamstring in the infamous um, Supta Hasta Padangustasana assist. Ooh. And you're laying uh, on your back, you have your big toe, you're lifting your body. Tabby Joyce came over. Put his leg or foot on your leg that's on the ground and laid on top of your other leg. Pushed his hand, pushed the other leg to the ground, Ooh. and it audibly popped. Ooh. And uh, everyone in the room could hear it. cringed. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next day, he was like, Oh, you skipped that today. <laughs> like, he gave me two days yeah. of not doing it. And then yeah. I was back to doing it. Yeah. So it was this, it was, it was very painful. Um, that's a rough one. I had trouble with the food, the spicy food, but actually I was sad to leave when it was time to go. Yeah, It was good for me to leave because I really need to heal my body. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so oh, I love uh, and I did go and I went back. <laughs> and you went back, of course, right? Because it's as challenging as it is, it's still somehow so fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I uh, decided that when I went back, I had to stay another month because honestly, I felt like it took me a month. The other thing I had trouble with was just the time change. I mean, India is 12, you know, it's day is night, night and day for with the United States. And so I just really had a hard time yeah. just not feeling out of it a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to ask Cindy just because I mean, I, I really only want to stay in a realm of positivity and good vibes. And I love hearing all these stories. But how have you been? Able, how have you processed all of the kind of changes that have occurred over the years and mm, people's feelings about it was too aggressive? Mm -hmm. I got hurt. You're being very honest, like, look, it was amazing, but I got hurt. I had a great mm -hmm. time. I also was really sick. I mean, this is the reality of mm -hmm. international travel and or that type of yoga practice. Did you go through any growing pains in the last few years when there was fallout and all that jazz? How, well, how I um, I had moved on from Ashtanga before the Ashtanga uh, wow. had its fallout. Yeah. Um, because my body couldn't take it. That's basically how it came down to. I had a. I also had a chronic low back problem. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the beautiful things about Richard is he brought a lot of people into the studio. And one of the people that he brought in was John Friend. And um, so I met John and um, 
And one, and one of the things I loved about John was he offered teacher trainings. And I did one of his teacher trainings. And um, one of the gifts that John gave me was he got me out of pain. Like wow. he taught me how to not have my back hurt. And mm -hmm. that was pretty important for me. Very important. Yeah. <laughs> because I was kind of a little bit at my wits end because I loved the practice, but it was not working for me anymore, especially as I was getting a little older. Um, so, you know... I appreciate um, your honesty. So I feel I feel like Anasara Yoga saved me and allowed me, and then that had its own trajectory. So <laughs> yeah, fascinating, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I have my own back problems and mm -hmm. I'm learning how to navigate it. Do you know what sort of name the problem would have been given? I have a spondylolisthesis, so my L five mm -hmm. slipped forward, and I. And I, I, I ruptured in between S1, L5. Mm -hmm. So my back bending game is just like a totally different, uh, you know, experience these days. I, I bridge at the most and I'm just ordered yeah. down the grass and I'm like, no, no. And, yeah. and yeah. you know, so many yoga people are like, oh, back bending will fix your back. It's so good. I'm like, I know, but I'm trying to tell you, man, it's, it's, it's not that simple in my situation, or maybe it is. And maybe some light will shine and I'll go, oh, and I figure something out, but I just would love to hear what you learned because I I'm learning. Well, for me, it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I actually the only diagnosis I really got was that I had really severe disc damage in those lower um, discs, and um, the way I could work with it is first of all, backing off and not trying to grab my ankles in nerd reductions, <laughs> which, is, which is just really not in the range of motion of many people. And back bends were always super challenging to me. I could whip my foot behind my head, stand up and do all that kind of stuff. The forward bending was my thing, you know, uh, putting both feet behind my head and that kind of stuff. But um, the the for, the back bending just didn't work for me, and so for me it was really backing off, really learning how to work my feet and my legs very strongly, and then you know not uh, so you know for me to do the back bends with the Toby Joyce pulling my hands to my ankles, I was like splaying my legs out, shoving my coccyx up, and you know just crunching the lower vertebra, so. Um, I just really had to not let my legs splay and, you know, work my legs and my feet and keep uh, from um, really pushing my groins forward and, you Thanks. know, backing off and slowing yeah. it down. Yeah. Cool. Well, then did you then choose not to go practice with the Tabby Choice because you were fearful of the fact that he would say? Well, I, I just slowly down. transitioned from Ashtanga to Anasara. Got it. Got it. And I became an Anasara certified teacher and taught that. But the Ashtanga, I really consider it my root, you know, my yeah. home in many yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I personally don't think that the series are necessarily the most intelligent sequences. And I certainly think that the range of motion required for many of the postures is not possible for many bodies. And, you know, my sense of it is it was developed on, you know, young boys. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. women, in, women in their 50s and 60s, maybe it's not the best yeah. thing for. Yeah. I hear you. But, <laughs> well, I appreciate you laying all that out because it's so yeah. important, I think, to acknowledge the reality of all of this. It's excellent. Yeah. So then... Yeah. I mean, but uh, but I, I what I love about Ashtanga, which is what I, what I wanted to say, was I love the emphasis on the breath, and of the drishti, and just the the beautiful thing that Anasara gave me is a disciplined practice, you know, and and showing up on the mat, and I took this into my meditation practice when I finally started meditating, and just doing it, you know, you do. It's all practice, you know, 90% practice or whatever the, <laughs> the adage is. 
And, but that was a gift because it taught me a, a certain discipline and to just show up whether or not how I'm feeling or whatever happens on the mat or the cushion that day, that's all good. You just, you just do it. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. And, and still, you know, now I'm teaching, you know, kind of my own thing, uh, kind of alignment based vinyasa, I would say. Um, and uh, I always start with the breath, you know, just emphasizing the breath and coordinating movement with breath. Yes. Because I feel like for people who are just asana students and maybe not meditate, that allows them some access to a little slightly deeper, more subtle place within themselves. And it starts kind of that inward trajectory. Yes. Are you yeah. currently making a living as a yoga teacher? Well, I'm right now I'm pretty, I'm semi-retired, I would say. Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, teaching four yoga classes via Zoom a week and I teach meditation. Nice. So, you know, that's one of the things that I always felt like in the Ashtanga system, you know, where does it, where does meditation come in after you learn third series in pranayama? I'm not, you know, it was, I felt like it needed to be integrated in because when I started studying yoga philosophy, like when I read Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, it's sort of like it was all about meditation. Really, it had nothing, very little to do with what I was doing on the mat. And then when I got into Anasara, I felt like that there was this presumption that you were meditating, but there wasn't really a method given. I had in Mysore, I had um, hooked up with a teacher at the Sanskrit college to study yoga, to study the Yoga Sutras and Bhagavad Gita and other texts with. And he had taught some meditation and, um, but his only instruction was clear your mind, <laughs> which <laughs> it just didn't really work. And I, um, I basically thought I didn't, you know, I was no good at meditating or as a bad meditator or something of that ilk. But one of the beautiful things about John Friend is he also brought a lot of amazing people into his workshops. And one of the people he brought in, I, I mean, one of them was Douglas Brooks, who I studied with quite a, a lot and Sally Kempton beautiful being who also recently passed and um you know Bill Mahoney brought in but he also brought in um Paul Mulortega and um from Paul I learned meditation and he also after um he's, he has a meditation school called Nilakanta Meditation and um, after many years of kind of bringing up a bunch of students, he started training us to teach meditation as well. And so cool. I teach that as well. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. What inspired you to write this book? Well, um, a whole a whole lot of things. And I do I talk about this a bit in the book. I integrate some of these stories that I'm telling now, but um you know, when I was at the yoga workshop, I started, you know, there were times when I would have some experiences in the asana practice of feeling uh, kind of a witness conscious consciousness um, emerge. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about that practice is, again, that focus will take you internally on the breath if you if you let it. And I was really curious about what was happening. And so I, I sought to study yoga philosophy and I was so confused by it mm. because it seemed, first of all, to have little to do with what I was doing in my yoga practice. And second, it was impenetrable. You know, uh, back then there weren't a lot of translations out. Um, invariably you were pointed to the yoga sutra and most of the translations were extremely academic. And um, and it was just very confusing to me. Uh, 
like being in India and all the gods and goddesses and then the swamis and just trying to put all that together. And so I put myself on a path of serious study of philosophy. And, and the form that took a lot was just putting it out there. I'm going to teach a class on the yoga sutra and people came to my living room and we, you know, I was like maybe one step ahead of the students and we just worked on it. And I um, started getting invited to come into um, teacher trainings to teach philosophy and that sort of thing. And in one of those trainings, I wrote a diagram on the wall or on the you know a whiteboard. And I realized, well, this is a really succinct, nice summary of the teachings. And it was it was an amalgamation of both classical yoga and tantra, which is kind of, uh, where uh, Anasara and, and Nilakanta meditation are, are associated with. And I realized it was a book and I realized that it would, could be of great service to write the book that I wish I had had <laughs> when I first started <laughs> exploring yoga philosophy to, to honor the, the texts so in the book, I, you know, I give actual aphorisms and translations of aphorisms, but then I really try to explain them in a very accessible way make, that makes sense to a modern day practitioner, as well as I include a lot of exercises to make them applicable to your life. Nice. So, yeah, it's basically the book I wanted. That's great. How, <laughs> how long did it take you to put it together from the moment you said, okay, this is what I'm going to do to this moment where it's actually published and available for me to go to Amazon and click and it arrives at my it was, door. It was probably seven or eight years. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you, you know, I, yeah. what I learned is that a book has a life of its own <laughs> and it took me a while. It was hard for me to figure out how to order it for one thing. I had all the pieces, but how to make it flow was a little harder to figure out and how to address some of the issues like highest consciousness. Like what is highest consciousness and explaining, trying to explain that. Good point. <laughs> Can you help us out a little with understanding the intersection points of the yoga philosophy or the philosophy of the yoga sutras and such as a text text like the Shiva Sutra, which is a tantric text. And mm -hmm. then we hear there's the renunciate path, such mm -hmm. as the yoga sutras might kind of cater to the monk, the nun, the, the renunciate mm -hmm. and the tantra path, perhaps helping the householder. Um, can you, touch upon a few points where they intersect and seem to have the same philosophy and some of the points where they are really different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's a big question. It is a big question. How much time? <laughs> <Okay. All right. laughs> but I address all of this in the book cool. and um, in short, this is what was so perplexing to me in the beginning because the yoga sutra, you know, classical yoga, Patanjali's text is clearly a renunciate text. And I went around to every teacher who I could and, and, and the teacher that actually sent me to um, Richard, we would sit around after class and I, and I would ask him, it's like, I don't really understand. It's like, if, if we're here in this world in these bodies, then why is it trying to teach us to subjugate the bodies, you know, it's like, I really, really, it just didn't resonate to me. And that's why I, I um, was very happy to find the tantric path, but um, the tantras assume that, that they kind of take the yoga sutra and classical yoga for granted, and they build on it. So they don't completely negate it. But, and this is kind of the history of philosophy um, in general in yoga, is that it's a progression. And, and this is what's kind of confusing about it is 
there'll be, you know, a particular school and then someone else will come along and say, well, this is what they got right and this is what they got wrong. And so I'm going to make this other school and then the next people come along. And and um, so what Tantra adds to classical yoga is this idea of a higher consciousness because the Yoga Sutra has this concept, kind of mysterious concept of Ishwara, but they really don't want to go to the place of saying that there is um, a, a there is a higher uh, consciousness. Mm. The Yoga Sutra really is a dualist text, and that it says there is this separation between matter and spirit, whereas in the tantric non-dual. Um, schools they say that everything is a manifestation of the divine so all of you you know humans are as well manifestations of the divine and the idea is to that the path of yoga can actually help you amplify your life as a householder and this is something that's been mixed up a lot where renunciate practices are given to householders and it can actually kind of block them. Whereas if you, if you're doing instead a practice intended for householders, the idea is that it supports your life. Yes. Good point. Yeah. So do you feel like that's a big, I don't want to say mistake because I mean, there is really no mistake if we're learning, but mm -hmm. do you feel like that's, well, I think it. I, think it, I mean, I remember sitting around in Mysore with uh, having conversations with other students about, you know, uh, what you can eat and what you can do, and you know, a lot of of um, there was a real renunciate thrust I felt in the community to some degree, and um, so I, I I just think it gives a lot of confusion uh in general in the yoga world uh when what is mostly taught in teacher trainings are is the yoga sutra <laughs> which has that flavor of negating you know a, a great metaphor is um one of the ocean and the wave where the ocean is consciousness and um you know we are each uh, individuals who rise out of that ocean and in classical yoga or renunciate persuasions the idea is to flatten your way back into the ocean whereas in a tantric perspective the idea is to amplify your life wave mm -hmm. to draw on the power of the ocean the power of the higher consciousness to really live your life in the fullest possible way that's cool. And, you know, that's where I end the book with in terms of coming back full circle to the social psychology that I was in. Um, the very last uh, chapter of the book is called Change Consciousness, Change the World. Because I feel that as we each work on ourselves in these ways, um, it has this ripple out effect and we all know this i mean that's why we want to hang out with certain people <laughs> that's why richard's classes you couldn't even hardly get in you know the door there were so many people there because certain people have a vibe that um you know that you can pick up on and so each of us as yogis can create via our practices a connection with our hearts and that's going to ripple out into the world it's going to help us as individuals make the choices in our lives that is that is more most beneficial for ourselves and the world at large as well but collectively when you know there's a, a mass of us that are starting to um, really connect to our hearts and live in ways that are aligned with the highest um, that's gonna slowly start shifting things <laughs> on the planet nice. Good point. 
Can you speak a little bit about your original intention to help change racism? You're witnessing late 60s, early 70s uh, culture and what was going on. Um, can you explain a little bit about the transformation of consciousness that can occur from someone being racist to not being racist? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's another <laughs> That's a big question. You know, I think each of us, I know with a lot of the current events that have happened, um, even though I was well aware of the, the literature and social psychology, as well as the yoga philosophy, um, I personally, had to and still have to look at, I think we each have to look in ourselves and understand our unconscious biases, first of all, and as well, be honest about um, the structural aspects in our society. So that's one level that we really, you know, that really needs to be addressed. So I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think, oh, if we all just get connected with our hearts, you know, <laughs> there won't be any racism because it's, it's out there. And so the, the, as I said before, the work I had done in um, graduate school convinced me that um, we really had to work at a deeper level as individuals. So to the degree people are willing to do that, it will shift things. Yes. Not it's not not everybody wants to go there. So <laughs> things get perpetuated. And that's why we really have to look at, you know, I feel like we have to work at all levels to effect yeah. change. Good answer. Great yeah. point. So yeah, because I don't want to go into, you know, this so-called spiritual bypassing <laughs> situation. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you say you have a, a new student, imagine I'm a brand new student and I've never picked up a yoga book. I've seen a yoga sign on a building, like I drove by, saw a sign. That's as far as I've taken it. And I drop in on your meditation class. Mm hmm. Where, how, where, at what junction do you want to enter me? Like, what are you gonna take me down a little bit of yoga, yoga sutra philosophy just to kind of prime mm -hmm. a little historical understanding of uh, an evolution from this philosophy and the the what tantra brought to these classical philosophies to bring it a little bit more appropriate for humanity? Where, where, where would you want to start me? Like, a, what idea or concept do you think? Uh, and I and I guess it's not a real world situation or not. I have had a little bit of study, so. But mm -hmm. it, if you if you could imagine, I was just a brand new practitioner. How, where would you start me? Well, usually, when someone approaches me about meditation, I ask them why they're interested in meditation. <laughs> so I mean, that's that's kind of a segue in um, cool. because. If someone, you know, sees a sign and they open the door, it means that there's something of interest to them. And, you know, in the yoga philosophy par parlance, that can be related to adhikara, you know, your, your readiness to pursue something. So... The fact that someone asked the question, you know, means that there's there's something inside them that is wanting something more. And then, you know, the way Nilakanta meditation works is it's a it's a um, one on one thing um, where you you sit down and you do talk a little bit about these issues that we've been talking about, like what does Yoga Sutra teach us about meditation? And then what does Tantra, you know, add on to that? And then um, you learn the practice and how to do it. And it's, it's, uh, it's, so I don't 
the way I teach meditation is one-on-one and, and um, small groups, mm -hmm. but um, so I don't, I don't have meditation classes. I have cl a class where we, I call it the full circle class where we do, um, we do uh, like 45 minutes of asana and then we sit down and we do pranayama and some chanting and then we meditate together as a group it's a very beautiful format it's not for very many people but um nice yeah and i but i don't teach meditation we just sit together the part that wouldn't be for many people is because it's so you would you it would take so much time like when no, you no we do it in an hour and a half okay so it's not too bad but um <laughs> Not too Most fun. people like, yeah. don't want, you know, there's not a lot of yoga. Asana teacher, asana students who meditate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just How the truth. Is. Yeah. Do you think that it's that scale will ever tip? Um, well, there's a lot of people who meditate and don't do yoga asana too. <laughs> so um, yeah. I, you know, and I used to have arguments all the time with one of my teachers about you know the superficiality of yoga asana and you know blah 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 and and i always said it's a doorway you know i wouldn't be here if it weren't for yoga asana it's i think for many people it's a way that they can in our modern society that they can move their body and move energy and find a little bit of peace of mind and I think once people get a taste of that, then many, many people are called to, you know, some of the other aspects of yoga. Very cool. When when you sit down for meditation, obviously you may mention that you follow a tradition or a style of practice called Nilakanta. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain technique there? Uh, how much does that technique weave in chakra philosophy? Um, it doesn't really, I mean, it directly, um, it's a mantra based meditation and, um, really the work with the chakras would happen kind of as a result of doing the meditation rather than trying to mess directly with the chakras, if that makes sense. That's <laughs> and that's one of the points actually that I make in the book is, um, and that I, that I learned from my teacher, Pablo Ortega, is that when we regularly meditate and we take our awareness into these deeper spaces of awareness, a lot of things happen and that's where some of the teachings of the yoga sutra come in because the yoga sutra explains how the samskaras you know the chitvrittis are brought to um quiet by the the um kind of the burning up of this all this samskaric residue that's within us and um you know addressing the kleshas and all of that that is in the yoga sutra and when your awareness starts to become clearer because of repeated, you know, burning up of samskaras and, and, and the attenuating of the kleshas, then other things naturally happen from the inside out rather than from the outside in, if that makes sense. So the, the chakras will start opening up and that's, you know, when you might have the kundalini experiences <laughs> naturally because that's been um clarified and the and the subtle body is ready for it how would you explain your own personal kundalini experiences that you've had well i think you know within the realm of meditation People can have all kinds of experiences. And um, that's not really what we're after. We're after actually um, higher states of consciousness. We want to stabilize in states of consciousness that allow us to be centered and clear 
and to start recognizing in ourselves our own divinity and allow us to then also um, recognize that in everybody else. And again, getting back to the change consciousness, change the world, when we can recognize the divinity in everything, it leads us to um, uh, treating each other as divine beings and the planet as well. So the thing is, is because we all have a different samskaric patterning, um, Paul Mulortega calls it the prior originating matrix that we have. All of our experiences, whether it's the experience in meditation or how we interact with the world are kind of filtered through our unique, um, you know, kind of samskaric patterning. And so I think all kinds of different experiences can happen for different people. Yeah. Good answer. That's a hard one to answer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, it, what's tricky about teaching meditation in particular is that um, you, as a, as a guide, you want to kind of let people know what to expect, but you don't want to set up expectations. <laughs> it's a conundrum. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> Really is. You be aware of this pitfall up ahead. What pitfall? Oh my gosh, I'm falling into that pit right now. Yeah. yeah right. Right. Good point. Good point. And that's one of the beautiful things. And this is so different from Batabi Joyce. You know, Batabi Joyce was really all about practice, no theory. And so, you know, one of the things that I appreciated about um, ta Tantra and this method of meditation that I'm involved in is that we always teach theory and practice simultaneously so that you you understand what's happening and why you're doing something, not not just do it. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me too. Yeah. Do, you, do you think sometimes I came across, I, I used to, uh, my one of my first yoga teachers that I, uh, Bikram Chowdhury, Mm -hmm. a really nice man and uh not very nice but pretty mm -hmm. intense um good yoga teacher but not morally good yoga teacher but anyway and he would often people would ask questions and he'd be like look you're, you guys are so stupid you're not going to understand the theory just do the practice so i when i heard that i was like didn't settle with me well i was just kind of thought that's a really bad answer to give. Like, why not give us a little bit of something? Like give us some theory behind why we're doing what we're doing instead of like, don't even ask. You're not even smart enough to know if I tell you, you're not going to be able to hear. I tell you to straighten your leg. You can't even straighten your leg. So what's your problem? Just focus on straightening your leg. Do you think? Yeah. Well, that, you know, that kind of comes back to this idea of Adhikara. I mean, he's saying you're not ready to receive the, um, you won't understand this. Yeah. And one of the, another thing that I, that came out of the Tantra, especially the teachings of the, this wonderful um, sage named Abhinavagupta is this concept of Vikalpa Samskara. And um, Vikalpa the Samskara. idea is that when you first, and what it means is refinement of understanding and also refinement of your consciousness. So when you first encounter a teaching, in fact, you may not get very much of it, <laughs> but as you work with the concept, then it starts opening up for you. Simultaneously, if you're meditating, your awareness itself is getting um, clarified so that anything you place into, you know, any teaching or information that you place into that awareness um, is more readily uh, understood. Mm. So it's a progression right. of right. Uh, understanding over time. And, you know, that gets to the notion as well, a tantric notion of upaya, which is uh, means, you know, the correct means. And so really as a teacher, you kind of have to be able to meet your student <laughs> where they're at with the correct methodology. Yes. So, you know, and there's a way you explain things to beginners versus other people. Yes. You know? Yeah.
Man, that is so fascinating. Have, have, what type of response have you gotten from your book? Like, have you had anybody come back yet and say, oh, this is good? Or, <laughs> or maybe negative criticism, like, I don't like it. Have you had any feedback that's... Well, I, I had, uh, I mean, I developed, the, the book came out of many courses that I taught. So I had been teaching courses on yoga philosophy for many years. They took, you know, sometimes I would teach about a text. And uh, then I started teaching things like I taught something called the wheel of yoga and then something the year of yoga where I just, I was really developing the book, like pulling out, you know, just kind of making sense of it myself. And I got a very good response from it, which was supportive of me writing the book. I did a, you know, kind of a beta test of the book with uh, a course. And I'm actually, I do have a study group on Facebook. I might take it to Substack. I'm debating on this where we'll have kind of a book discussion. So mostly, you know, what I, the feedback I do get from people is that, um, they're appreciative of me really bringing the authentic teachings into play, but also making them accessible and applicable. Nice. And um, and so far, I've gotten good reviews. Uh, I'm, you know, I'll be honest and say I've been scared to put it out there. <laughs> Because, you know, once I mean, you do, I you're subject that. to, you're really subject yeah. to criticism. Yeah. And one of the points I make in the introduction of the book is I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. I've studied a lot of Sanskrit, but, you know, I've provided my own translations and I'm sure there are errors and, you know, I'm sure there are plain places people could say I haven't treated particular topics appropriately, but swaha. You know, <laughs> it's my offering and it's the best awesome. I could do at the time. And uh, yeah. hopefully it'll be a benefit for people. Well, it's amazing. That is a big turning point to actually be like, oh my gosh, I've written this, but am I really wanting to put myself in that place of, of potential criticism? And then just saying, yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm ready. I feel good about this. I feel like this is a reflection of my life, my study, my everything that I'm about, what I'm interested in. So I'm so glad you did. That's awesome. I, I, I applaud you. I have fancies and dream or fantasies of, of writing a book. And then I just go, wow, where do I start? So just the fact that you like followed through, I'm, I'm asking this question tongue in cheek. I know we have a few more, just a couple more minutes here. How much of chat GPT did you use to write the book? <laughs> absolutely none <laughs> well done you know the more i the more i interact with um ai i feel like writing eventually is going to have to come to a point where just like when we go to the grocery store and we choose either chemically grown food or non-gmo food or organic food and that at some point we're gonna we're gonna need to like pass a test saying this was a human written a uh, book versus this is an AI written book. And then we can choose, okay, I want to read what a human wrote, or I want to read what the internet wrote or a, an artificial um, bot. So that's pretty cool. I think that's worth bringing attention to mm -hmm. that yeah. you, you wrote this yourself out of your own brain, mind experience, which I still yeah. value. I really like the AI thing, so I'm not poo-pooing it. But I, yeah, I, I think so that, I think there's some good things that it can be utilized for. Yeah. But I think, but maybe, you maybe even writing books. I don't know, but but AI wasn't around when I was. <laughs> you know, it wasn't as good. Chat GPT wasn't available. No, no, when I was no, writing I, this, and I did follow a process that I actually do outline in the book of <laughs> where you put a teaching into your awareness. You know, you meditate a little bit, you put a teaching into your awareness, and then you write about it. Mm. Because there's something about letting it percolate deeper in your awareness rather than using your analytic mind about it. Mm. And then letting your awareness stream out through your hands onto a piece of paper or onto a computer, you know, a, a computer cool. that it's, a you know, it, it allows you to get to a deeper 
you know, understanding beyond kind of an intellectual understanding. And then when you have to articulate it, it even makes it more real. Nice. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you were to say you were to come here and teach a workshop, a weekend workshop, would you focus on writing prompts with students? Like, have you, have you led a workshop setting where you introduce a philosophical idea and then say, okay, I want you all to write and then have people share it? What, what type of um, structure? Have yeah. You... I mean, often that's what I have done in my workshops and yeah. in my courses in particular, yeah. where we, we, you know, take a teaching and we do just that. We, uh, read about it. We you know we do the intellectual work of understanding on an intellectual level, but then you sit back and you just kind of, it's a, you know, it's like a contemplative practice. It's called bhavana. And so you just allow, again, I, I already explained it, but um, That's cool. it's a way to bring, it's a way for people to make the teachings their own. Yes. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Wow, Cindy, this has been such a treat. I, I'm so thankful to have this opportunity to meet you and to speak with you. All the links for everything is here. So for you listening, just click below and you can find Cindy, her website, cindyluska.com. You can find a link on Amazon to purchase the book. Can we? Can they reach out to you, Cindy, via your website on an email if they have questions? If we sure. have questions. There's a contact on my um my website for sure. Nice. Is there anything else you would like to add in closing for our session today that, that you want to share? Well, just, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I wanted to really make an argument for why meditation can be a beautiful practice. And I think many people feel that this is a, that it somehow takes away from life and it requires some major effort when it can actually be easily introduced into your life and can have profound effects. And so I just encourage everybody to, you know, consider uh, integrating meditation into their lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person, although this computer thing is pretty cool that we can, you're in Colorado and freezing, freezing temperatures. I'm here in Florida and I'm sweating and um, <laughs> some, and here we are is awesome. We transcended uh, space and time for a few moments <laughs> and uh, well, thank you so much. It's been a delight to thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I look forward to meeting you in the future in person.